afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my topic today is make risk-based testing a reality. Uh, I chose this topic for a couple of reasons. The principal one is because we all talk about risk-based testing, and I think many of us try and practice it, but we're, we often find ourselves at a disadvantage because being testers, we don't necessarily have the best idea of what risk really means to our business customers. Um, the second reason is because I think that management often use the, the, the term risk-based testing as something of a buzzword, and they don't necessarily understand that uh, it's not just a way to limit the amount of testing we do. Sometimes, in fact, it may mean we have to increase the amount of testing we do in given areas of the system. So I think it's very important to put a process behind risk-based testing so that we have an accurate idea of, of business risk, as accurate as we can ascertain from talking with the stakeholders, and that we then use that to direct our testing. That's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, I don't ever believe that there's only one true way to do anything, and I certainly don't believe that about risk-based testing. But what I'm going to suggest today is, is a way that I've used that I've found very useful and that I've talked to my, to my uh, consulting customers and that they have also found useful in directing their testing. You'll see we have a poll here, and uh, it would be very interesting to, to me to have you fill out this poll, and then we'll, we'll do another poll at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar and see if you've changed any of your, uh, any of your opinions. Um, I won't trouble you with the introduction, but let's carry on. So we test for a number of reasons, but principally, to provide information about the risks of implementing software for, for our customers. When we don't do anything, there's a huge number of unknowns about our software systems. If we were able to do complete testing, well, then we might have certainty. But in reality, we have to balance, and, and we balance on a fulcrum of risk. We all know that complete testing is, is an illusion. We can't do complete testing. So we try to find ways that we can, we can get adequate coverage. Here are some of those ways. Risk-based testing is a way that many of us introduce, and we do that as a way of finding out what really matters in the system and matching what we do in our testing, both, both from an effort point of view and from a coverage point of view, to what's really there. Because we want to make sure that we're testing the right things uh, at the right time and to the right level of rigor. But we don't want to waste our time with, with unnecessary effort on, on the low-risk components. There's a lot of benefits from doing risk-based testing. And I think these are, these are some, some really important benefits. The principal one is that from a testing point of view, if we know the things that could go wrong in a system, it helps us to understand how we can put tests in to actually try and find those bugs and remove those risks. But here's another really important one, and that is to manage our stakeholder expectations. There are two really important components of risk-based testing, and, and my contention is that you really have no value from one if you don't have the other. Um, it's great to, to get an accurate assessment of risks or as accurate as you're able to get, but if you don't also manage your stakeholder expectations and get their buy-in, it's not really very helpful because you can find yourself at the end of your testing process having finished testing the system, and yet you don't have, you don't have the stakeholder buy-in that you've tested the right things. And you may even, in fact, find that they reject your testing. So it's very important to manage your stakeholder expectations. And by going through a risk assessment process with them, you help them to understand that not everything in a system is equally risky, but at the same time, there are real risks that they need to take seriously. I did a project once in a hospital, a consulting project, where I was helping them set up a testing process. And when I got there, they were doing an enormous, transformation of their, of their IT systems. But when I got there, the project team, the development project team, had not been able to get the concept of software risk across to the clinical practitioners. 
I, I met with the clinical practitioners, and I said to them, okay, here's, here's the scenario. We are introducing a system where we are matching up path records, um, records of clinical tests that are being done on patients with the actual patient records. There's a possibility that we could get that wrong, that somebody's lab record could be linked to the wrong person, and that could, in fact, happen on quite a broad scale. If we got it wrong with one, we could get it wrong with many. They looked at me absolutely aghast, and they said, that could really happen? Well, yes, that could really happen. And, of course, the risk is enormous in that kind of circumstance. So it's really important for us to get it across to our stakeholders that, yes, there are real risks in what they're doing. Of course, they're not all, all life and death risks as they would be in a hospital. But for, for them to understand that there are real risks, and those are the things we need to take seriously and we need to, to focus our testing on. There's a final benefit, which is that sometimes companies need to demonstrate that they have done the right things, that they have exercised their best professional judgment in trying to estimate risk and that they have, have uh, actually tested for those risks. And risk-based testing gives us a way, if we do it properly, to demonstrate that we have exercised that due diligence. Risk-based testing doesn't address every category of risk in a software approach. So what it does do is it targets the implemented system's potential for causing harm or loss to one or more stakeholders of that system. We don't do worry about project risk at this point in the project. We don't even worry about the testing project risk. Those are all things that are accounted for in other processes. But when we're doing risk-based testing, we're looking at how the implemented system could hurt someone. Now we know that the impacts of, of software failures can be potentially catastrophic. And here are some of the ways that can happen. So what we try to do is we implement a systematic risk-based testing process. And here are the principal steps for that. First of all, we get together with our stakeholders and, and together with them, in a collaborative process, we identify what the risks could be in the implemented system, and we assess those risks. We then take that risk assessment, and we develop our test strategy based on it. Finally, of course, we implement the risk-based test strategy. We use it for our testing. We use it for, for our bug fixing, and so on, throughout all the testing process. I find that a very good way to do it at risk assessment is to conduct a workshop with those stakeholders. It makes them part of the process. It gives us the opportunity to find out what really matters to them. The really good thing about it is, is that it can be scaled for different sizes of project. You can do it very small scale, potentially with, with interviews or with small groups of people, or you can do it with, with quite a large scale by getting everyone together. The important thing, though, is to document the results and get some sort of agreement, whether that's sign-off or, or whatever the process happens to be in the project you're working on. The very first thing is to identify who are the stakeholders who really matter. And here are some questions that, are, that, help you, that can help you do that. First question really is, who is going to benefit from the implementation of this system? Who are the sponsors of the system? Who are the users of the system? Who are the people who use outputs from this system? You need to look at all of those people. But you also need to look at who could be hurt by it. Some of those are going to be the people who stand to benefit. But there may be others as well who, who have no potential benefit but could suffer harm or loss. They might be bystanders, depending on the nature of the system. Finally, when you've gone through that process, it's really important then to say, okay, which are the ones whose interests are really important to us? We may not be able to include everyone, but we want to make sure we include the ones whose, are, whose interests are the most significant to us. And in some cases, of course, if they're, if they're unknown customers, we may not be able to include them in a, in a risk assessment workshop, but we want to have someone there who represents their interests. 
It's important when we go through this process not to forget the development team and the IT stakeholders who, who may be people who are maintaining the system or operating it once it's in production. By including the stakeholders and by making them an integral part of the process, you're asking them to take ownership for the result of the risk assessment. And here are some of the things that you're asking them to agree to. First, that you can't test every condition in every component of the application equally. That's not always something that, that occurs to business stakeholders in particular up front, so it's important to get them to understand that. Of course, you want them to buy into the risks that have been identified and the assessment of those risks. Finally, of course, you want them to agree that the test strategy that you, that you develop based on the risk assessment, will in fact give adequate coverage. There's some preparation you need to do before you do the workshop. And in fact, the preparation is probably more time consuming than the, than the workshop itself. First of all, we said get the right people. Be very careful how you word your invitation. And in fact, you may, before you do the invitation, you may want to go around and talk to people. Business stakeholders may in fact come back and say, well, you know, that's your business, you get on with it. So you want to make them understand why they want to come, why this is going to help them, how their input is going to be extremely valuable to the project and in, and in the long term, to the, how it's going to serve their interests. And finally, you want to design the approach for that workshop. Now, your approach is definitely going to be different depending on the kind of project you do. If it's an infrastructure project, you're going to have a particular set of questions that are primarily technical. But um, for the majority of projects, you're going to have questions that are oriented to what is new in a system, what's changing in a system. And then you need to design a structure for capturing that assessment that works for the kind of project you're doing. I'm going to focus primarily on a new application or, or functional enhancements to an application because for most of us, uh, we're dealing with business systems and those are the kinds of projects that we're usually dealing with. So what I find is, is the best thing to do is a matrix, typically in a spreadsheet, where the rows are components, representing a high-level business view of the system features. Um, if it's meaningful to the business users, it will be meaningful to everyone else. I make sure that, that I don't go down to too low a level of detail, but at the same time, I make sure that I've got adequate coverage so that I'm covering all of the functions, uh, features that are important to the stakeholders. If it's, web, if it's a web-based system, the pages are all covered. Uh, any screens are covered, and of course any reports coming out of that system. And if it's, an integ if it's integrated with other systems, make sure we cover the interfaces. So any other systems that could be impacted downstream, for example, in, in, in an integrated solution. I find it very useful to take that representation of the system and walk it around. Walk it around to the people who, who are going to be participating in the workshop and make sure that they all understand that this is the representation we're going to be working with and that they agree. Um, tinker with it and, and make sure that you tailor it so that they understand exactly what it is that you're dealing with as you go through it. Here's an example. Now, I chose this example for a reason, um, principally because uh, it, it shows how it's important to tailor the language to the particular set of business customers. In this case, uh, this was a hospital, healthcare example, and you can see that I've got, I've got red, yellow, and green here for the risk assessment. Uh, in this organization, they used a particular set of terms to categorize risk, and they used it throughout the project, not just, not just for testing. So anything that they considered to be high risk 
they called patient critical. That, of course, brings it really home to everyone on the project, exactly what we're dealing with when we deal with high risk. Uh, if it was, a, if it was a, a medium risk, they called that clinical business normal, and then a low risk, they called economy. So economy, of course, meant that we were going to make our efforts economical, whether that was testing or anything else. You'll see that I've stuck to three levels of risk. I think that's really important. You don't want to get it down to, to really fine gradations. High, medium, low is a really good way to do it. You'll see also that in addition to listing the components in the rows, I've talked about two aspects of quality here. One is functional and one is usability. In other projects, you might be looking at several different aspects. You might be looking at performance, for example. You might be looking at maintainability. It depends very much on the nature of the project. But you always want to make sure that you've looked at what are the aspects of quality that we need to consider and, and where we need to assess the risk. When you're actually conducting a workshop, it's important to ensure that you've got clear roles, um, that you explain to all of the participants what you're doing and why it's important to them, and that you begin by brainstorming on what risk could mean in this application and what risk means in this organization, so that you put some boundaries around what you're doing. And then you work systematically, going through the matrix, going through the components. And my suggestion here is, is that you do this visibly and, and uh, that you do that you capture the work as you go through. So project what, what you're looking at on the screen and, and that you have the scribe update all of the results of the workshop in the matrix as you go. And at the end, you have an agreement with everyone that they own the result. So I've talked about roles here very briefly. You need a facilitator. Typically, that should be you, the tester or a test manager who, is, who, is, who has set up this workshop and this risk assessment activity. You need a scribe, and that should not be the same person. It should be someone who is focused strictly on capturing the results of the workshop. And of course, you have your technical represent, representatives, and you have your business reps. Um, the technical people are there primarily to talk about what could go wrong in given components of the system. The business people are there primarily to talk about why that matters to them and what kind of impact that can have on them. In the initial brainstorming, you really want to look at overall risk. They like said that's a really good place to put some boundaries on this. But talk about what kinds of risk matter in this organization. Um, if it's a healthcare organization, you're really talking about, about patient safety, about uh, health and life. If it's a bank, you're probably talking about financial loss primarily, but you may also be talking about reputational risk. In fact, you probably are talking about reputational risk. You may also be talking about, about um, regulatory risk, legal liability, those kinds of things. In some organizations, you may only be talking about disruption to workflow, but then some workflows are more critical than others. Or you may be talking about additional work caused by problems in a system. There may be some givens you can start with. For example, uh, in a bank, probably, uh, well, well, I'll give you a Canadian banking example. In Canada, just about the worst thing that can happen from a risk point of view, other than the bank going bust, is, is uh, questions asked in Parliament. It's a serious reputational risk, and, it's, and of course, uh, potentially a legal risk. Um, the, the next level down might, might be appearing on, on the front pages of a national newspaper with some, with some horrible problem, and, there's a, and there are further levels down. So there's some givens, typically in an organization, that you can start with. It's good to talk about who could be hurt by a system and who we care about most. And I call that a hierarchy of concern. I, I find that in most organizations, the typical hierarchy of concern that I hear about is our customers come first, our business partners come second, 
Our employees, of course, we care about, but that's less important to us. However, uh, there are different categories of employee, and, if, and one of them is the CEO or the CFO. So, you know, an impact to, to our CEO, something that could put our CEO in jail if, if, if for instance, we get the financial reporting wrong, um, obviously those things we care about. So it's good to get that hierarchy of concern out and put it up on a, on a whiteboard or somewhere where everyone can see it. Then some generalities about how this application could hurt each of those. I alluded to the possibility of putting the CEO in jail. It's a remote possibility, but if it's a system that, that has important financial implications and uh, where you're doing regulatory reporting, then that could well happen. So it's important to get each of those things out. A good question is, is again, for, for boundary setting is to ask, what is the worst thing that could happen? Well, could this put the CEO in jail? Could this system kill someone if, if there were a failure? Could it cause major financial loss? And then uh, what I talked about before, which aspects of quality should we look at? Should we look at performance as well as functionality? Should we look at usability? Are those all important things to us? Here's a starting point example that I took from a retail organization. These are, these are things that they always know whatever system they're looking at. Pricing must always be accurate through all our integrated systems. And here are some of the impacts we can have from that if they're not. We absolutely have to be certain of the accuracy of financial data used in our regulatory reports or, in fact, in critical business decision-making. And then finally, a somewhat, a somewhat lesser concern, but still important, we need a high degree of confidence that our inventory numbers are accurate, because that's really going to direct our bottom line. Once you've gone through those preliminaries, then you can walk through the application in detail. And here is where you get into the, into the really uh, nitty-gritty of the, of the risk assessment. Go through and ask for each piece that you have in the matrix, for each component you've identified, what could break? What could happen? What fault, what, what will happen? What kind of fault or failure could occur here? How likely is it? And then if it does, how is it going to show up? And what's the worst thing that will happen as a result of it? Having identified the worst thing, let's talk about the most likely thing and how bad could that be. And here you then want to be working with your business stakeholders to ask about the impacts to them. Who in the business or who the, the, the business cares about could be hurt by it. What thing that the business really values would suffer harm or loss? And here is where you're looking at things like reputation, um, financial liability, health and safety, uh, business workflow, business workload, and so on. And then where in the business is this thing used? Who uses it? And how often is, is it used? Because those questions can also help you get a good assessment of the risk. And, and don't assume that just because something isn't used very often, the risk is lower. For instance, uh, an important function that, that uh, is only used once a year and yet it's part of a, a, business, a business critical workflow, it could actually be a higher risk because if it's only used once a year, people tend to forget about some of, some of the quirks and, uh, and they could make really serious mistakes. So it's important to look at those questions and to look at them really carefully. And then, of course, what other things could go wrong in this component and how likely are they? Once you've got the risk assessment developed, you can use it for all kinds of things. It's not just a testing document. And, of course, the earlier you do it in the project, the more likely it, it is to become a, a really essential project document. If you do it early enough, you can use it. You, you can give it to the development team, and they can use it to guide their design and development. Of course, it's going to be part of your test strategy, and it guides the testing, how you, how you direct your, your coverage and rigor throughout the way you test the application. It's a really good touch point 
for you and for the project manager to make decisions if things change or if dates are slipping or all kinds of things, if you have to change your strategy, for instance. And it guides you about fixing. So it helps to, to understand just what is the real severity of a bug, what is the real impact of a bug, and, and to set priorities for bug fixing. Finally, of course, it can inform a go-live decision because uh, you can look at it and you can say, okay, we identified this part of the system as high risk. We weren't able to get to it. Guess what? Maybe we're not ready to go live. Using it to develop a test strategy is, is of course, the basis of your risk-based testing. So walking through it with the technical team, deciding what kind of test you can use to cover off each of those significant risks and mitigate those risks. Note, though, that it might not be a dynamic test and you might not be responsible for it. Then you can map to it and you can use that matrix for, for your reporting as you go through your actual testing. I won't list these off, but here are some of the, the testing activities that you might want to look at as you're doing that, all the way down to post-implementation verification. I want to stress that risk assessment is not something you can do mechanically. It is very much a thinking process. Probability and impact, which are really the two things you're going to be looking at in a risk assessment, are not objective. There tend to be subjective conclusions. So it's really important to get the sources correct. You need to be aware that getting an accurate assessment of risk is not easy. It's a kind of requirement, and it's just as difficult uh, to elicit from stakeholders as getting a, any other kind of requirement. So the more you practice at asking questions, the better you get at it, and the, better, and the higher your level of skill. Um, great to have tools. Don't use them as a substitute for thought. Finally, I, I would say don't use qualitative measures. I'm, I'm sorry, don't use quantitative measures for risk. Use qualitative measures, high, medium, and low. If you get into using numeric values, that can really be misleading because it, using numbers gives a sort of spurious authenticity uh, and, and spurious objectivity to, to a risk assessment that kind of masks the fact that it is in the end, a set of subjective conclusions based on people's best professional judgment, but nonetheless subjective. Um, and, and last, you do need to be aware of group dynamics when you do a workshop. Just because someone is noisy or a good negotiator doesn't mean that they're the best informed. So that's something that, that the facilitator, and if that's you, that's you, the facilitator has to manage in doing a workshop. Of course, that's true of any sort of workshop. Just a couple of other considerations. Make sure you look at technical impacts as well as the business impacts. Uh, your business users may not care or may not think they care so much about, about technical risk, but it's important to look at that. Remember that, that risk doesn't is not necessarily constant over time. So, for example, uh, an impact that you can live with uh, for a month after a system goes live say, additional workload for, for, for several people could become intolerable if, if you had to live with it for three months. Or alternatively, it could be the other way around. Uh, something that, that is an impact the first month after a system goes live could, in fact, go away after a month. So it's important to look at that and to use that as part of the risk assessment. Risk assessment is not a static document. It should be living throughout a project. You don't want it to, to be constantly changing, but you do want to keep looking at it, and you do want to make sure that it reflects the latest knowledge that, that people acquire as they go through the project. Okay, so here's the final poll. Uh, it would be interesting to get your reactions. And I think we're just on time for, uh, for questions. Okay. So someone has asked to, asked to bring a poll back at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm not sure whether he was asking, Peter, I'm not sure whether you're asking, should we bring the initial poll back 
or, or whether it's adequate to have this second one. If it's the initial one, Ina, can, can we manage that? Okay, it's the initial one, yes. Yeah. I have another question from Deepa asking if project risks can be used as inputs for, for risk-based testing. Uh, of course they can be. Um, but uh, actually I'd be more interested in, in understanding what you mean by project risks. One pro okay, let, let, me, let me guess, uh, but, but, but I'd also be interested in what you have in detail. Um, one project risk might be, of course, that we don't have adequate time to do the testing. And in that case, sure, that has to be an, an, in, an input for risk-based testing because, because it's going to be a boundary uh, that we have to fit the rest of our testing into. If that doesn't answer your question, I, I, I'd like to hear in more detail what, what it is you're interested in. There's also a question from Ronald asking what is a good group size. Uh, the answer to that really is it depends. I have... Um, I've done a risk assessment workshop with as many as about 25 people. That's a bit big. I would generally prefer to work with a group of, um, say, 10 to a dozen. But um, it's difficult in some organizations to keep the, the group size small. So what I would suggest, actually, is if you have, if you have very large numbers of people to deal with, is that you work with each group separately and that you, that you ask each group then to, to each functional group, say, to choose a representative to come to, to a final session where you, where you consolidate across and get everyone's agreement. I have a question from Bart on what's the difference between risk-based testing and requirement-based testing. Interesting question. Requirements-based testing is typically where you go through and you make sure you have some number of tests for every requirement. Um, in risk-based testing, you can combine them, by the way, but uh, in risk-based testing, you're going through and you are assessing what happens when those requirements have been implemented and what could go wrong when they went in the implemented system and how that's going to hurt. Uh, so you're not putting an equal emphasis on every requirement. You're, you're looking specifically at the implemented system and, and the differing ways in which harm or loss could result from a fault or failure in that implemented system. Um, I have a question from Kenneth to say a workshop takes time. Business analysts have workshops at the start. If testing also have workshops, that takes extra time. Does this really need to take place at the, the analysis stage? It's helpful if it takes place at the analysis stage. But you want it to be far enough along that you have a good picture of what the implemented system is going to look like from a component and a feature and, and, and uh, a screen and a report point of view. So yes, these things take time. Um, and one thing you could consider doing is, is working with the business analysts to combine and, and uh, look at the risks around specific requirements. But uh, as I said, it's better if you have a good picture of the implemented system. So you might want to wait a little and do it a little bit later on. I have a question from, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Yosef. How often should a risk list be reviewed? Well, that, that depends on your project. Generally speaking, I would go through, um, and we're talking specifically here about a risk list for, it's not even a risk list because it's, it's an assessment through an application. And that's a, that's, that's a somewhat more detailed thing than, a, than the sort of risk list you would have for testing project risks. For testing project lists, I would review those weekly, for sure. For um, the risk assessment for, for an implemented system, 
It would be a good idea to do it weekly. I would certainly do it every couple of weeks and go through and just make sure that you still agree, particularly with the principal risks. Um, I, if you don't have time to spend a lot of time on this, I would look at the high ones to make sure you still think they're high, and I would look at the low ones to make sure you still think they're low because some of them could have gone up. Question from Sergey. Does risk-based testing provide the priority of testing features in a requirement specification only or anything else? I'm not sure I understand the question. I would say, again, rather than looking specifically at a requirement specification, I would, I would look at, at, at constructing a model of the system and a model of the system that is meaningful, a model of the implemented system, what it's going to look like once it's implemented, that is meaningful to your business stakeholders. So a requirement specification is one way to do that model, but it's not the only way. Um, I hope that, that answers the question. Okay, let me just make sure I've covered off anything else that might be here. Good testing tool management. This is from Dimitri. Any good testing tool management where to define risk-based testing? Well, depends what testing tool, tool management, what, what test management tool you are using. Certainly you can, yeah, certainly you can use, um, say you're using uh, Quality Center, something like that. Certainly, that that is a place where you can where you can flag your tests as as being directed to high, medium, or low risks. But um, again, this is a strategy. Uh, this is this is doing a risk assessment is, is something that informs your test strategy. So it's likely done before you even get to before you get to the point of defining those tests. So again, I think it's it's something that you need to do at a modeling level, and that then that model then uh, directs the the test the tests or the test cases that you're going to use. So I'm sorry, that's a, that's that's um, it's not a very clear answer, but generally speaking, I find it better to simply to use a matrix, and then to use that matrix to to direct the strategy. Uh, you can then link the 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 rows in that in that spreadsheet to whatever tool you're using going forward for, for your, your uh, test cases or your tests. Let's see if there's anything. Should we ideal this is from Deepa again. Should we ideally have a matrix of risk exposure factors for each function or feature? Yes. I think you certainly should. Uh, and you should have a sense of what could go wrong uh, for each function or feature, for that, for for each thing that could go wrong, um, a sense of the probability or the likelihood of that occurring, and then the business impact of that occurring. And um, I would caution you, going back to to not having a calculated risk factor, I would caution you always to think in terms of of the actual impact and not simply of the probability. Say, for instance, you were testing the navigation system for, uh, for a car or, or a steering system for a car. If a steering system fails, it'll kill people, not just the person driving, but, but potentially bystanders as well. So the impact of, of a failure there is very, very high. Um, regardless of probability, you probably still want to direct quite a bit of testing in there. So the risk exposure factor becomes quite high, even though the probability may be low. So that's a case where you really want to not get, get caught up in a mechanical calculation. Okay. Not sure how we're doing on time here, Ina, but um, let me just see. Here's one last question. We sent out a questionnaire for a first identification of risk items. Got over 500 items. How to deal with that? Well, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a, a good tactic for first identification, getting over 500 risk items. Well, if you have over 500 risk items, 
I would suggest you're probably dealing with a pretty complex system. I would personally want to, to, to have a meeting with the stakeholders. I would try and group those 500 risk items in, in, into categories and, and perhaps a group of stakeholders who, who provided the risk items um, and work with each of them to try, potentially try and get that down. But 500 risk items is not a lot when you're talking about a, a large system which could have, say, thousands of tests or potentially thousands of tests. So, uh, but I would definitely try and group them and categorize them. I think you'll all agree with me that um, that was a very useful and interesting presentation today on risk-based testing. So thank you, Fiona, over there in Canada. You're welcome. And also thank you, thank you all for um, taking the time out to be with us today and attending today's webinar. Uh, yeah. Let me just add, Ina, that, that today we've, we've, what I've really done is outline a process Okay. Um, in my seminar, in my tutorial at, uh, at Eurostar, what I'm going to be doing is working with the participants to develop uh, specific questions and working through an analytical framework for asking those questions. And then we're going to practice asking the questions of, of uh, stakeholders in the room. So uh, because, as I said, it's really important to develop that skill at asking questions. Uh, so we're going to be looking at, at the, the sort of core of the process and we're going to be practicing that process. Okay. Well, I think um, I think there'll be a lot of people attending your tutorial, Fiona, um, and I hope they get as much. I'm sure they'll get as much interest out of out of it as we did today from your webinar. And just to let everybody know who's attended today that um, this version of today's webinar is, we're going to have it available up in our webinar archive in the next coming days. So um, I will also post the, the poll results that we had as well up on our website. So you can avail of those there as well. So the webinar is now finished. And can you all ensure to log out now, please? So thanks very much.